ज्येष्ठराजं ब्रह्मणस्पतासाधन वक्रतुंडमहाकाय सूर्यकोटिश्रभ निर्विघ्न कुरु मे दीव सिद्धि बुद्धि शक्ति सहित श्रीमहागणाधिपत नमो नम निर्विघ्न कुरु हरि ओम ओम श्री नम ओम नमो मंत्रे so uh can everybody see my screen first of all uh and i'll need you yes yeah uh, let's see chat yes 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 perfect so this is the intro to vedic astrology and um let's dive into what it is exactly that we're doing as vedic astrologers so what is uh the birth chart it's a snapshot of the heavens at the time Right, at the moment a baby is born a question is asked or a match is played because a birth chart is the the map of any space time event and human beings like any event a question uh or a competition are are there's no difference because each has a birth a life and an ending right so every question contains the seed of its answer every birth conceals the fruit of its life every battle's outcome is known from the moment of its inception this is the core precept of astrology as i understand it that means that the moment a question is asked or a child is born there are certain karmas that are set into motion based on that space time event that can tell us a lot about the nature of that person or that event okay so to do this astrology uses a map of the sky drawn for a particular uh space time event to judge its potential all right whoops well wow. let's go back here right now this space time map is commonly represented in western astrology by a circle so you're some of you are probably used to this okay um in vedic astrology i'm sorry i'm having just a, a bit of a issue here with uh the presentation software okay in vedic astrology we have the square charts that look like this and these are probably for you vedic astrologers uh what you're more used to seeing right um while the western depiction is perhaps a closer representation of the heavens there are a number of reasons why we opt for the square shape in vedic astrology so a lot of students ask me you know why is the chart square why isn't it round it makes more sense if it's round well to understand why we use a square shape first you have to understand that vedic astrology jyotisha is part of a lineage it is called a vidya uh an inspired living body of knowledge that is part of a family of vidyas that includes ayurveda vastu tantra mantra and others that comprise the vedic lineage by the way guys i'm reading this because i spent a lot of time preparing this presentation so i figure i'm going to actually read it to you um and and then we'll move on to where it's a little more loose and and i'm actually presenting uh in the picking the sky in depicting the sky as a square Jyotisha borrows from its sister science Vastu, which says that square shapes are inherently more stable than their curvilinear counterparts. So, what does that mean? Well, take a look at this. Who is the stable square um, in this couple? 
it's this guy, right? And you can see that this is the, the thing about uh, these sacred sciences is that they represent nature as it is. Uh, the Sanskrit language represents the sounds that we that the human apparatus naturally makes. Vastu represents reality as it naturally is. And intelligent and intuitive artists, athletes, philosophers, thinkers will intuitively know that the stable, sort of uh, earthy person will have the square face. And that's how they draw him. Even the glasses are drawn that way. Do you see that? And whereas the adventurous one, the one who wants change and movement, is going to have a more circular face or even a triangular face for action. And so Disney and, and our favorite artists and, uh, and poets and athletes know how to tap into these without necessarily even knowing about Ayurveda or Vastu. They in, in, intuitively do this. Uh, and what the disciplines that we're learning are trying to convey is they're trying to systemize this knowledge in a way that makes sense. I mean, I could go on about this face. He has low set ears, which tend to mean that the person um, uh, comes into their own after age 35. They, you know, they reach their maturity late. There's late bloomers. And this is all material that we cover in our Dharma type certification. We go into depth about uh, Vastu in, in in art, Vastu in building, Vastu in faces, and so on. Uh, and, and I'm not going to belabor the point here. But here you see a circular chart. Here you see a square chart, in a sense. Um, and, oh, and, and so there you go. So these Vastu shapes, not to get on a tangent, but I really want you to understand this point. The circle, when it comes to faces, gives these qualities in the person. So people with circular faces tend to be very public oriented, likable, like a child, and the water element is present. In dwellings, they tend to create movement, instability, and change, and so on for these other shapes. If you've seen a person with a long rectangular shape, they're ruled by the air element. They are scholarly sensitive step by step, whereas someone with the uh, triangular or uh, this rhomboid shape has a different dharma type, has a different element that they are ruled by. And as a result, just knowing these five different shapes can help you truly understand the character of a person. And that's why, and the reason I'm bringing this up now is to, to help you understand that Jyotisha, Vedic astrology, is not just looking at a piece of paper. It's truly linked to the other sciences, uh, including um, Ayurveda, Vastu, Yoga, uh, and such. So, moving forward. In Vastu, squares and rectangles indicate stability and durability, humankind's way of carving out a piece of permanence in an impermanent world, while curvilinear shapes connote movement, restlessness, and change. Okay, and again, oops, we have, um, and the square's affinity to permanency and order is perhaps why Vedic astrology appears to some people to be more faded and predictive, while Western astrology's circle is more psychological. And here we have an illustration of how human beings like to create permanence. If you've ever flown in an airplane and looked down anywhere over civilized, civilized, uh, so-called civilized uh, areas, you will find the square shapes. Our houses, our lots are all squarish or rectangular, whereas nature is curvy. So in a sense, the square chart is nature's way of, oops, okay, that's interesting, all right. The square chart is, is, is our way of creating order in nature uh, and sort of tying it down to a piece of paper and to uh, a chart. Uh, there are other philosophical reasons why we use the square chart, but I won't bore you with that because I think uh, we've probably said enough about that. 
Uh, and again, I apologize. Sort of present, this part of it here is a little bit off, but anyway. Um, so we'll begin. We'll begin with with this chart and this square, and uh, just pretend that these houses aren't here for the moment. Only the number one should be up. So we have house one. So in this square representation, we have twelve aspects of life, and uh, each of these twelve aspects are called houses in Western astrology, and that and that's a term I'll use often. In Sanskrit, they are called bhavas, bhava. Bha, which comes from the root bhu, which means to be. So there are states of being. Um, uh, let me just ask you guys to mute yourselves here. I'm going to mute you guys. So we go. Cool. There we go. So this square chart is a map of the entire reality that you can experience. And each of these 12 houses uh, contains a bit of that reality. So everything from toenail fungus to rocket fuel to cream cheese can all be described by one of these houses. So in a sense, the meanings of each house are limitless. However, each house does have a specific set of meanings that are most common. So when we look at this here, the number one, the common meanings are the self, the body, your charisma, your health. This is essentially you. And as a result, this first house is the most important house of the horoscope. Okay, I'm gonna draw a little, there you go, to highlight this house. Now, notice that there are little numbers here. For the moment, we're not gonna pay any attention to what are called Arabic numerals. These are the Arabic numerals. They're not really Arabic, they're, they're they're Sanskrit or Indian numerals, but it's okay. That's what they're called. We're going to pay attention only to the Roman numerals. We'll come back to these uh, later. So the Roman numeral indicates the house. And the first house is the self. All right. Then the second house is everything, in a sense, that is not you. Meaning, if the first house is you, the second house is what you eat, first of all, to become you. So it's your food. It's what nourishes you. And in the, in the world today, it's money that we exchange for goods and services that also nourishes us. So nourishment and money are ruled by the second house. The second house also rules family in a general way because the first house is you and, and it re represents your birth. The second house is everything that is outside of you, uh, specifically those people who are nourishing you. So when you're born, it's your mom. Later on, it's you know your extended family. And when you're older in life, it could be your nephews and nieces. It's whoever, whoever is nourishing you at any given time. Okay. So the second house is a second is a house of nourishment. All right. All right. Um, then moving forward to the third house, the third house rules everything that you do. Do in the sense of uh, activity done with your hands, because the way we express ourselves in the world is with typically with our hands. So we write, third house is writing. Um, we, we push people away, we pull people towards us, we use tools, tool use is the third house. And as a result, as our use of tools becomes refined, we, we become artistic. So first we begin to scratch with a rock, then we write with a pencil, and then we draw with a paintbrush. And the, the, that gradient, that sort of, um, exp the, the house that describes that experience is the third house, okay? And it also rules our self-effort. Here it says courage, but it's more like your, your push and impulse to express yourself in the world. So to review, first house is you. Second house is what you eat so you can remain on the planet and all the things that support you, like money, 
your immediate family and food. And then once you're fed, the third house is how you express yourself in the world, primarily with your hands. Then we have the fourth house. Fourth house rules your shelter, the land you live on, your home. It also specifically rules the mother. And because for a lot of us, the mother is the first teacher, the fourth house by extension is the place of education. Uh, suggesting that early on your education took place at home and it was largely dictated by your mother. Uh, as a result, uh, it also rules your inner psychology, your, your deep mind, your emotional nature, which we know from modern medicine that, that a lot of that, how we respond to the world is formed in those early years by our home life, unstable home life, unstable psychology. Uh, so property, home, mother, education. The fourth house also rules movable property, sorry, it rules cars and transportation, which are, you know, our temporary homes. And if you live in a big city and commute and drive maybe three hours a day, like I have many friends who do, three or four, even four hours a day spending in a car, it's, it's your temporary home. All right. So that's the fourth house. The fifth house rules children, creativity. It's the house of creativity, essentially. Children are a physical uh, expression of your creativity, um, but also uh, it, it rules poetry, art. The third house rules the actual physical act of creating and expressing. But the fifth house is the more refined essence of intuition, creativity, and also intellect. And combining intellect and creativity, you have the, um, the necessary uh, stuff to become a minister, which in Sanskrit is called a mantran uh, or a mantri, uh, which means someone who has the capacity to give advice. A strong combination here, uh, for example, I saw a chart the other day who had Saturn exalted in this house, and, and I said this person is a consultant. They must be a consultant. And the person said, yes, they've been a consultant all their life, because this fifth house being so prominent, so strong and powerful by having an exalted planet, comes out. The meanings will come out. We'll get to exactly how to find out if a house is strong or not later. So con consultancy is the fifth house, and it's a strong house to have if you're going to be an astrologer. Interestingly enough, it's also the house of, of gambling and investing, because you need to, A, take consultants, right? But also you need to be able to have a good intuition and intellect to weigh between different options. So those of you who are joining me on this uh, journey into winning with Vedic astrology, the fifth house is one of the houses we strongly consider uh, to make sure that you uh, that this is part of your uh, path. All right. Then the sixth house. The sixth house rules service. It is the least sexy house of the horoscope, meaning that it's all the stuff you do like brushing your teeth, uh, you know, daily habits, going to the bathroom, taking a shower, all the things that are not sexy that are actually uh, necessary and required for you to have fun and, and creativity, for you to enjoy all of the other houses. You need the sixth house. So in a sense, the sixth house is the stamba, the pillar, the... Uh, of of the entire horoscope. Of course, the first house is the is the pillar because it's you. But without the sixth house of daily routine, um, and 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 understanding of the disease process and and what averts it and and therefore uh, promotes health, you won't be around on the planet too long. All right, that's in natal astrology. In what we're going to do, the sixth house is one of the houses we're going to. 
uh, pay special attention to because it also rules competition and, and victory. The desire to hammer your opponent on the head or to, you know, to, to be first. This is the fighting house as well. And finally, it's also a house of adoption. But that's, that doesn't have anything to do with uh, our winning with, with Jyotish. But it is a house of adoption. So pets, you know, things we adopt, as well as uh, adopted children are ruled by the sixth house. Any questions so far? And this may be very basic for some of you. And, and if that's the case, I apologize. But all right, well, let's move on to the seventh house now. Seventh is everything that is not you. So if the first house is you, the seventh house is your opponent. And interestingly enough, in the Vedic tradition, and, and in a, actually in the Western as well, the fifth house is the house of the lover, the concubine, the paramour. And it's a house of fun and play and pleasure. Whereas the seventh house is the house of the marriage partner, the spouse. But it's also a house of war. So either the ancients were very cynical about marriage and, its, and the institution, or they really had their eyes open and they said, well, marriage, in a sense, will teach you how to truly interact with another, how to compromise, and otherwise it's a battlefield between your ego getting, winning and the ego of the other person winning. And you can see here, the seventh house is the other. In sports, as I mentioned in our uh, first video on um, uh, winning with Vedic astrology, the first house represents the favorite, or, or in, in a horary chart, in a prashna, it represents the team you asked about. So if you ask me, hey, is New England going to win the Super Bowl? I would be looking at the first house as New England, and then the seventh house is their opponent. But if you just said, hey, who's going to win the Super Bowl? then I would put the favorite, which again would, would have been New England because they were the favorite, in the first house, and then the underdog in the seventh. Okay, But the seventh house is very important both for sports and for natal astrology because it represents everything that's not, that's um, the other, the, the client, the uh, spouse, the person you're working with one-on-one. -on -one. It also represents independence, and uh, for people who are wanting to start their own business, you need a very strong seventh house to be able to run your own independent business. Um, without this, because it's how people react to you. It's how the other buys your product. Or, or, uh, and without this, without a strong seventh house, if you're telling me, hey, Simon, I want to start my own business, um, you know, selling widgets or, or pens, let's say, on Amazon, will I be successful? And I look at their chart and I see that their seventh house is not great. My first inclination is to say no, because the other is not likely to respond well to them. And so they would be better off in a service, in a job that pays nine to five, all other factors being equal. So how seven very useful for judging independent business. Of course, there are other factors to consider, but um, that's one of the major ones. All right, any questions so far? Is, has everyone thoroughly been uh, lulled to sleep by now? Hopefully, not all of you. Okay. Uh, Simon? Mm -hmm. Simon, this is Mensa. Um, everything seems to be uh, understandable. Um, I like the pace. Uh, I do need to drop, though, right now. So I will try okay. and time back in uh, as soon as I can. All right. I appreciate you telling me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All righty. So let's keep going then. House 8. This is the house of everything that is old, uh, including one of the things associated with old, old age is death. Um, 
uh, the eighth is also a house of sex and the sex organs, especially the external sex organs. And when we look at uh, health in the horoscope, if a person were to have, say, Mars in the eighth house, um, then one of the things one can expect is a Martian, a heat or a cutting or a painful affliction to the external sex organs or the anus. So hemorrhoids, Mars in the sixth or the eighth, a likely outcome is hemorrhoids. Um, <laughs> and at the risk of being too crude on our first class, <laughs> uh, I'll give an example of what uh, something my mentor uh, is, was reputed to say when he saw a chart with Mars in the eighth, he boldly proclaimed, this man has a crooked penis. So, okay. Forgive me if, if that's a little too bold, but why crooked? Because Mars, one of the names for Mars in Sanskrit is Vakra, and Vakra means crooked. Um, because Mars goes retrograde in a very weird way, very different from all the other planets. He does his own thing. But also Saturn here and, and other negative planets can um, create uh, health issues. But the point is, old things also include ancient traditions, specifically ancient oral traditions like astrology, like Ayurveda and yoga. So stuff you won't learn necessarily at your local university. To my knowledge, Ayurveda and astrology aren't yet taught at uh, Harvard and Yale, though perhaps they should be. Uh, so that's the eighth house. Then the ninth house is the house of this. Is, if the eighth house is the most uh, objectively negative house of the horoscope because it rules death, decay, and suffering, the ninth house is the most objectively positive house because it rules grace and good luck. It also rules travel, higher education, your father, and your guru. And it also implies that while the mother is the early educator, later it's the father who takes on the role uh, and gives quote unquote higher education. Now this, you know, whether this has a correlate in real sort of uh, society, I'm not sure, but astrologically that's the implication. The ninth house, then we have the 10th house. This is the house of success, of fame. This is the house that is the highest. So if you were to look up while you were facing south and you look up, you would be looking at the 10th house because the 10th house is directly overhead. What does that mean? Well, it means that, let's do this. The first house represents the east. The fourth house represents the north. The seventh house represents west and the 10th house represents the south but also the 10th house is all that's above and the fourth house is all that's below so if a person has say all of their planets located in the fourth house you can bet that they're likely to want and to want you to respect their privacy the fourth house is, is what's below the earth. It's secret, it's dark, it's where the sun don't shine. And these people are very interested in psychology. I'm drawing planets here. So, if, But if someone has their planets in the 10th house, they're very likely to want you to pay attention to them, to, to be a leader, to be in the public eye. Because these, are, these planets are above the horizon. We can slice the chart this way and say, Everything here is above the horizon. And th as the sun sets here, it moves below here, it moves below the horizon. Okay. So the 10th house represents the apex, the zenith, the apotheosis of skill and achievement in, in this world. If you don't know what apotheosis means, it's okay, I don't either. All right, so now the 11th house. The 11th house is gain, investment, and wish fulfillment. 
it along with the fifth are the two houses we're going to really strongly consider for um for investment and for to see if you know um uh any kind of an investment will profit you or you're going to profit other investors meaning you're going to lose money so uh this is an important house to look at uh personally and then finally the 12th house which is loss moksha isolation travel um, so these are the 12 houses of the chart. Now let's get rid of some of this stuff here. Any questions about the houses? Um, I have a question. If you don't have any planets in a house, does that, does the house still have influence in your life? Um, that's a great question. It, no, it means that house is completely lost for you. So you have, if you have no planets in the house of mother, you have no mother. That's it. <laughs> okay. okay. Next question. No. So of course I'm being facetious. Um, yeah. there, are, there are only nine planets and yet there are 12 houses. So inevitably in everyone's horoscope, there will be houses that appear to be vacant. And uh, as we're going to learn that how the planets can influence a house not only by associating with it, being inside it, but also by aspect. Okay. So. Okay. Thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. So good question. But in in a sense, in a general sense, you can say that because, like in the example I gave just earlier, if you have four planets, say in the tenth house, or in any house that house is going to hog all the attention. For example, um, Osho, Bhagavan Rajneesh, uh, the famous guru, he had most of his planets in the eighth house, I think four or five planets, which singularly sort of uh, puts his life focus on eighth house stuff and among them, old things like tantra mantra and being a rebel also i you know the eighth house is rebelling against religion the ninth house being religion the eighth house is the <laughs> negation house to the 12th and therefore um negates everything that the ninth house is negation because it's 12 houses away from it we'll get to that so um so in a sense, the answer is, is yes, because if one house is overemphasized, the other houses will sort of be lacking. But no, every house is in play. Um, all right, so hopefully that made, that made sense to you. So let's move on now to the difference between the houses and the signs. In this North Indian chart that we're using, and by the way, I haven't uh, drawn the distinction yet, between the North and the South Indian, but uh, I, I will, uh, maybe, yeah, I will in a second. Uh, the houses are represented by Roman numerals, but these Roman numerals you will not find when you look at a horoscope. They're just used for explanatory purposes, and they are something you must memorize. So if you don't have these memorized yet, this is definitely your first order of business today. Uh, and, and certainly before class next week. So these houses are fixed, meaning that the rhomboid represented by the numeral one is always the first house, while seven is always the seventh house, and the remaining houses are numbered accordingly. What changes is the signs. All right, so let me just go back and explain what I mean here. This Roman numeral, this means this is always the first house that never changes. What will change is these little numbers here. Okay, and what these little numbers mean, what they stand for is the signs of the zodiac. So the number one is Aries, two is Taurus, three is Gemini, four is Cancer, five is Leo, six is Virgo, seven Libra, eight Scorpio, nine Sagittarius, then ten Capricorn, eleven Aquarius, and twelve is Pisces. So those of you who are new to Jyotisha, if I go back 
to this chart, can you tell me which sign is in the first house? If you can see it, can you see it? And I want somebody to chime in. I'm not changing this until I hear it from someone who is not in advanced Jyotishi already. Let's see. Sagittarius, thank you, Mr. Sachin. Thank you. That is correct. So nine here is not a number. It is the number represents the sign Sagittarius. Very good. And as a result, this person has a Sagittarius ascendant. The first house is uh, the ascendant, which also means rising sign, and in Sanskrit is called a lagna. Boy, these are a lot of terms, but I'm hoping you guys are familiar with these terms because ideally this isn't a course for absolute beginners, but as a refresher, hopefully. So lagna, the word lagna comes from the root lug, which means to tie down. And the lagna is what ties down the horoscope, the, the space-time event to a, uh, what ties down your question or an, uh, a birth to a particular space and time. It's also called an ascendant or a rising sign. So yes, so here Sagittarius is the ascendant, okay? All right, so let me go back to the mouse here. All right, so now, um, so in, in thus in North Indian charts, the first house remains fixed while the signs of the first house uh, vary from one Aries to 12 Pisces, depending on the time and place of birth. Okay, so that's what I just explained. And, and now here is the South Indian representation. In the South Indian chart, what remains fixed this, uh, is the signs meaning that the square that indicates Aries, and here is Aries, and here is that square. This square will always remain Aries. This is always Taurus, and so forth. The ascendant is what is going, and the other houses are what, what's going to change. So to indicate Sagittarius, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio. Here is Sagittarius. To indicate the Sagittarius is the ascendant, we usually do it with a diagonal line or we just write ascendant. This is how uh, the horoscope is depicted in the South Indian format. Now, I'm more comfortable and more familiar with the North Indian, and that's what I use. And I hope that will be acceptable to you. But if some of you are used to the South Indian chart, and believe me, even professional astrologers, when they are used to one type and they switch, their minds get boggled because you're just not taught to think that way. It's like being turned upside down and trying to have a conversation with someone. It, your, your world is a little discombobulated. Now, of course, some astrologers can manage both. And uh, certainly I bow to them as well, because while I can read the South Indian chart, uh, make doing it as fluently as I can, the North Indian is sometimes a challenge. So you will tell me if you're used to the South Indian, and I'll certainly make uh, concessions, okay? So that is the South Indian, but I'll primarily be using the North Indian for this class. So here, both charts have a Sagittarius ascendant. And of course, if this is the first house, then the second house is here, the third house is here, fourth house is here, and so on. Oh, and there they are, second house, third house, fourth, for this particular chart. Okay. 
Now, if a person were a Scorpio ascendant, then all of, uh, then all of that changes. If a person had their ascendant, let's say here in Scorpio, then this would be the first house, and then second, third, fourth, and so on. All right, just wanna make sure that's clear. All right, so it takes some time to really understand the, uh, the houses and the signs. And those of you who are just beginning on this path, uh, I will recommend a couple of books that are required reading as far as I'm concerned. I'm just gonna go ahead and write them here. Um, one of them is Path of Light by James Kelleher, which is in two volumes, volume one and two. And by the way, I have no uh, affiliation or, or any monetary uh, or other kind of uh, remuneration deal with James. He, he doesn't even know I promote this, his books, but, um, but they are very well written, especially from the standpoint of plain, direct explanation of principles. Uh, the second book, uh, which is actually frankly, my first choice, but it's the second book because it's perhaps more dense and more um, difficult to, to broach than James's book is Light on Life by Hart Defoe and Robert Soboda. Okay. Light on Life is, is uh, again, a very deep, profound uh, introductory work to Jyotish, but it's uh, a lot of advanced Jyotishis also can read it and find out uh, lots of new and beautiful information in it. So these are the two books I strongly recommend. And as a homework assignment in either of these books, please read thoroughly the chapter on the houses. And, uh, and, and and if you have questions, of course, email me, you know, that's why I'm here. But these are the, the books that I recommend, uh, at least to start with. And if you have uh, another book that you love that you want to read, then certainly uh, let, you know, let me know what it is. But certainly, that doesn't mean you can't read other texts. But these are the ones that I found very useful. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm briefly going to introduce the planets here. Um, and then move forward. All right, let's see, let's move that here. All right, since today is Tuesday, in at least this part of the world, uh, we'll start with Mars and who are the planets? Well, the planets are the actors. So if the houses are the stage, the planets are the actors on the stage. And I've already mentioned that, hey, Mars in the eighth house, consider hemorrhoids. <laughs> and if that's all you remember from this class, then shame on you or shame on me. But anyway, um, Mars is the general, the, the fighting, uh, uh, the warrior, and he owns the signs Aries and Scorpio. Mercury is the prince who owns Gemini and Virgo. And why are these numbers here? Because Aries is represented by the number one in a chart. Scorpio is the number eight. Okay. Uh, again, this may be moving too fast for some of you. And if it is, um, I encourage you in the meantime, between now and next week, or between now and uh, when we begin the full course, do check out my Decoding Your Life map with Vedic Astrology video. It's a full five hour introduction, and I go slower. And, and I really introduce the planets and their personalities and who they are. Again, for, the, for this purpose, I am assuming a bit of knowledge and understanding of Vedic astrology, okay? Um, and if I'm mistaken in that, then um, perhaps this 
the, the winning with Vedic astrology course may not be for you. Uh, but if this is all okay so far, then, then we're on the right track. All right. Mercury is the prince and he owns Gemini and Virgo. And um, yeah. And by the way, this is stuff that's basic stuff that actually we probably are not really going to use in the course. Uh, the specific techniques we use in the course are, um, well, yeah, you will need to know the ownership. There is one technique that uses the ownership. So for example, and, and I'll, I'll just give you a fast intro. Let's say the Aries, uh, that Scorpio is the ascendant, and so the ruler is Mars. And let's say that that Mars in the horoscope is located exactly in uh, where the star Regulus. There is a star in the constellation of Leo that is the heart of the lion. And it's what the Sphinx is aligned to. In fact, uh, um, it, I just mentioned this star yesterday to a student. In, let's say that the ruler of, of one of the teams is conjunct that star that connotes victory. Well, then you can say that, yeah, your team is destined for victory. Another way to use that is if Mars, which rules your, let's say, your first house, is, um, let's say this is the chart of a team. Let's say you're the counseling astrologer to the owner of the New York Knicks or the Dallas Cowboys, and they're just not winning the way they, they should win. It's, well, the Knicks, the Cowboys are doing well. <laughs> let's say you know the owner of the New York Knicks, and they have all the money in the world, all the talent in the world, but they can't put together a team. Perhaps part of that is because the chart for the team is just not a winning chart. So what you can counsel the owner as a mantran, as a counselor, consultant, is, hey, let's reincorporate your team. Let's redo the paperwork at a time when the ascendant or the 10th house are very, very strong. Then that team is now primed for victory. So you see, there are many ways to use this knowledge. This isn't just so you can go out and gamble or make yourself you know, rich and wealthy or whatever. This is also so you can use in a, in a, as a consultant to help your client or your client's business uh, in the New York Knicks or a business become successful by changing the chart of that business, if that's possible. So that's why we want to know <clears throat> which planets own which signs, because they become representative of, of, of what those signs indicate. All right. Is that clear? Is that making sense? Um, unfortunately, all I can see is my screen. I don't see your expression. So if I'm, you know, I'm not in, in a classroom setting, I can see puzzled looks, and then I'll look at the person and say, all right, Tell me what's going on in your mind right now. But um, being on the computer, it's uh, more difficult because I can't see your faces. So, okay, so I'm just gonna move forward. Hopefully this is okay. So Venus, the princess, owns Taurus and Libra. Saturn, the butler or the servant, owns Capricorn and Aquarius. And then the sun, who is the king, owns Leo. Moon, the queen, owns Cancer. And Rahu and Ketu do not own any property. They're the outsiders. Rahu is the dragon's head <clears throat> and the dragon's tail. So these are the actors on the stage. The stage is the 12 houses. The actors are the nine planets. And when I say planets, I mean that in the ancient Greek sense, where the term planetes means sky wanderer. A sky wanderer is something that moves through the sky. And wouldn't you say that the sun and the moon, as well as the other planets, appear to move through the sky? And in that sense, a star can be a planet in the ancient sense. 
a, an invisible point in the sky like Rahu and Ketu can be a planet, as can the moon, uh, as can asteroids, and so on. Okay? So when I use the term planet, I use it in this ancient sense, as do all astrologers, by the way. So if any of you are scientific astronomers, you know, chill. All right. So, um, and, and the term in Sanskrit is graha. Uh, and graha means that which grabs you. This is the direct cognate of the word to grab, grasper, where we get our word to grab. So graha is what we call, what I just termed a planet. So these are all called grahas. We will use these terms interchangeably. Okay. All right. So these are the, the, the nine planets, and they play on the stage um, of the 12 houses. So that's a, a brief and maybe a quick, but a brief introduction to the stage in the 12 houses and the nine planets. And where I'm going to go next is uh, to go a little more in depth about the houses. But uh, I just want to check in with everyone and make sure we're doing okay here. So any questions up to this point? Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to take your silence as being golden and, uh, and move forward. All right. So um, I'm going to use uh, some slides from our Dharma type certification course, um, during which we, we go through a full uh, class on Jyotish and uh, present this because it is pertinent to our presentation today. All right. Now, <clears throat> Houses, we've learned the 12 houses and their names uh, and their associations. Houses can be grouped in, in various ways according to what they represent collectively. For example, one way to judge what a person's life is about is to see, like you asked a question earlier, what if no houses are, have planets in them? That is telling. That can tell us something. So here's a quick snapshot, shortcut, rough and ready way to, to give some insight into your clients um, by judging which houses have the most planets. For example, the Dharma houses. I say Dharma because that's the English way. The word is Dharma. But just sometimes I'll say chakra too. When I'm in California, a chakra is a chakra, and that's okay in California. So the Dharma houses or Dharma houses are one, five, and nine. That means if we're looking at the horoscope, let's draw the horoscope here. Fancy. There we go. There's the ninth house, first house, and the fifth house. Can everybody see this? Yes? Yes, yes, excellent, thank you, thank you, all right. So if a person has the predominance of planets in these houses, again, this is very rough, but sometimes can be a can be very insightful way of judging what that person's life will revolve around. And dharma in modern uh, parlance relates to law, relates to spirituality, also politics, because Politics in its highest sense is leading a nation down the right path in an evolutionary way. And people who have planets in these houses primarily are interested in these things. So here's the chart of Abraham Lincoln. And so what do we have here? We have the sun and Mercury in the first house. That's one of the Dharma houses. We're going to ignore the outer planets for now, by the way. 
I definitely use the outer planets for winning with Vedic astrology, but for now we're going to ignore them for this. The fifth house, there's nothing. And then there are two more grahas in the ninth house. So a total of four out of the nine planets are situated in Dharma houses. Would you say that Abraham Lincoln's life revolved around law, politics, and evolution? Well, I think we would all agree that his life was around that. What is the other, what is the other trio of houses? The, the next trio that we're going to explore in a second are the Arta houses, the houses of uh, security. And so he has three. He has two in the second and one in the tenth. So three planets. So that is a secondary motive of his. But let's take a look at those right now. So here are the houses. Two, six, ten, collectively as a group, are called Artha. Artha means Wartha, worth. Kimartam Vadasi. Why? What are you speaking about? For what purpose are you speaking? Kim Arta. Arta means purpose, and the things that tend to give us purpose in life are our possessions. Oh, I have a house, therefore I have to buy insurance to protect it. I have a daughter, I have to buy a shotgun, so I have to protect her. Um, <laughs> I have things, and those things give me a sense of identity and purpose. My Mercedes tells people that I am well-to-do and secure. Um, so artha means wealth, but in a looser sense, in a deeper sense, it means security. And in an even deeper sense, it can mean a sense of, uh, in, it can mean purpose. So these are the artha houses, two, six, and 10. All right. And let's take a look at a chart. So there it is, security, which can take the form of career, family, or money. And someone, here's a chart of Leo DiCaprio. Someone who has a chart with primarily planets in these houses. Look at Leo. One, two, three, four. Four planets in the second house. By the way, guys, actors will often have a very, uh, especially like world fame. Brad Pitt also has a bunch of planets in the second house. Uh, I forget about Clooney's chart. But second house is the house also of the face. And actors who are well sort of liked tend to have a very active face that people recognize. But aside from face, the second house is a house of Artha, as is the sixth, as is the tenth. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six out of the nine grahas are in Artha houses. So a chart strongly oriented towards career, family, and um, uh, in a sense, possessions and, and value. Okay. Then we have comma, the houses three, seven, and 11. Okay, and I'm gonna sort of rush through this here. And this is relationships free enterprise. These are the houses of independent business. Remember I said the seventh is the key for independent business. You can bring in these two as well. And if someone has their emphasis on the seventh, the 11th, and the third, you can bet you being free and running their own life and business and entrepreneurial entrepreneurship is extremely important to them. All right. Uh, and then... Moksha houses four, houses eight, and 12. And they're appropriately black. Psychology, suffering, seclusion. So I had a client, a student actually, who had almost all of his planets in the eighth house. And everyone in class was looking at him going, wow, gosh, you poor thing. And he was the happiest guy. But when we, and when we asked him what he did, he said, um, I am a, uh, uh, I'm an AIDS counselor, meaning that I work with people suffering from AIDS. So he's working in the area of sex, death, and possibly in chronic suffering. 
And yet that was his life. That was his fulfillment. That was his dharma, his purpose in life. So in a way, you can find a person's purpose by looking at where their planets gravitate. And here is um, the chart of one South Indian saint named Amachi. <clears throat> you can see one, two, three, four of her nine grahas are in moksha houses, houses of of uh, liberation. And then the second closest is Kama, and she does like to have fun. And here is the chart of the aforementioned Osho with one, two, three, four, five planets in the eighth house. And even though the fourth and the twelfth are empty, this sets the tone for his life in a real, in a real sense. So that's one way you can use the houses, okay, by looking at them as a group. Here is another way to group the houses. And now this is, again, this is going into your reading assignment. If this is all new information to you, then you, you, I, I will ask you to supplement this class with reading the, the books that I mentioned earlier, Path of Light by James Kelleher, volume one. Uh, buy both volumes on his website, jameskelleher.com, um, or Light on Life, or both. I, and I actually suggest both. All right. So houses 6, 8, and 12 are the negative houses for horoscope interpretation because they, they have to do with these themes. For our purposes in judging who's going to win a contest, I'm going to teach you the important houses, and in fact, I did in the first lesson, which are the um, uh, upachaya, and we'll get to those in a second. Uh, so here, the negative houses are 6, 8, and 12, because they represent parts of our life, like disease and divorce, that we that, uh, generally consider, uh, you know, uh, not fun. Uh, eighth house, scandal, chronic illness. Twelfth house, incarceration. Not typically desirable things. The third house is a mild, mildly negative house. And there are those meanings. Part, part of the reason why the third is a mildly negative house is because it rules displacement. The third house is the negation house to the fourth because it is 12 houses away. I talk about this 12 houses away principle in uh, one of my other YouTube videos and, um, and in Decoding Your Life Map. But basically, any house that's 12 away from another is the negation house. So this is the fourth here. Counting from the fourth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We have the third. The third being the 12th to the fourth is the negation house. So it rules a loss of home, uh, a moving. And moving, divorce, and death are the three most stressful uh, things uh, that studies have shown uh, in, in, in an average person's life. So that's why the third house, and it also rules struggle and self-effort. <clears throat> um, and that's why the third house is a mild do Stana. Stana is place. Duhu means painful. Duhu stana. Du stana. And then the good houses, houses 159, are the houses of luck. The houses of Lakshmi, of, pr of prosperity, and another Sanskrit term. And I promise I won't use too many Sanskrit terms, okay? But uh, past good karma is called Purva Punya. Purva Punya. Then houses 1, 4, 7, and 10 are also considered positive, and therefore 9, 1, 5, 10, 4, 7, all of these are positive houses. Basically, anything that's not 6, 8, or 12. Houses 2, 11 are neutral. And there are the the negatives and here it sort of they're broken down okay oops so yeah so we're not gonna we're not gonna get to this right now but um 
this is um, a basic, I'll just, um, yeah, but we, we're not gonna pay attention to this, but the rulers of the good houses become good planets for you. So for today, uh, my goal in presenting this class today is um, to introduce you to the houses and all right so let me just kind of walk through this here i, I want to find the upachaya houses because this presentation takes a direction that i'm i don't want to go in um, okay yeah so we're not going to do that here This is, uh, this is from a class we did in uh, deco um, a Dharma type certification. So I apologize, I'm using the same uh, presentation. So, um, all right, so we've gone through the houses, we've gone through this, uh, the different types of houses. Uh, any questions in general about houses or the palas of the horoscope? Are there any South Indian Jyotishis in the room? South Indian astrologers who prefer the South Indian chart? Okay, so I'll take that as a no. Um, and I'll take that as an affirmation that what we're doing here is okay. Um, all right, so one more category that uh, that I'd like to present today, which I mentioned in the class last week, was another class of houses. And that is the Upachaya houses. Upachaya literally means accumulation from the root chi, chinoti, chinutaha, chinvanti. Chi means to collect. Upachaya means to collect and collect, so and to uh, therefore to accumulate. Um, these houses are three, six, ten, and eleven. And these houses are critical for. Um, competition. And when I say critical, I mean we're not only going to look at the house itself, but when you look at a horoscope, um, I'll, I'll clue you in on a little secret into where we're going with our uh, winning with uh, Vedic astrology class, which is. Um, uh, let's pull up a chart here. Where we're going is we can use the whole house to give us an idea of which team is going to win. And as I mentioned before, it's the team with the malefic planet in houses 1, 3, 6, 10, or 11. But what I found was that sometimes that didn't work. And I knew there had to be more to it. And so the essence of any house is the cusp of that house. The cusp is the, the most sensitive point. It's like the peak of the mountain. If a house is a mountain, the cusp is its peak. And when there are planets located close to the cusp, like for example, the ascendant cusp here is 734, Venus is at nine degrees. And so <laughs> this was the, ascendant by the way for the time that we started our class and um anyway so <laughs> just just as in uh games when venus conjoins the ascendant things don't um th things have a very uh, kind of specific outcome that you can expect but there is a cusp of the first house a cusp of the seventh also we use the cusp of the sixth and the 10th 
and they're opposites. So the opposite of the sixth is the twelfth. Opposite of the tenth is the fourth. And that's why we're going to pay very special attention to those cusps. And this chart here, this table, gives me the cusps um, of each of the houses. And you can see they're all seven degrees. That's because I'm very close to the equator and it's summer, mid midsummer here. If I were to do this for Minnesota, you would see that the cusps will change quite a bit. Um, and I can just... Uh, or Alabama, we'll just do it in Alabama. Think of the first place. And you can see, even though it's the same date and time, the cusps change significantly. So like I said, a cusp is the peak of each house. It is the most sensitive point. And when there are planets close to a cusp, so for example, here is the 10th cusp at nine degrees Sagittarius. Sagittarius to review is the number nine. There it is. If we have a planet within uh, two and a half degrees of this cusp, then that planet will affect outcomes in a much more powerful way. In Ayurveda, we have something called Marmani, Marma points. And think of this in, in the Western parlance, you could think of it as uh, Spock's uh, Vulcan death grip, right? Where Mr. Spock could grab somebody and put them to sleep. That's a marma point. And when a planet sits on a special marma point called the cusp, it will affect the outcome in a, in a more powerful way than just by sitting in, in the house itself. So in this example, the 10th house is at nine degrees, Saturn is at one degree. So he is not within orb to affect this outcome as strongly. So Saturn is not on the cusp. We also wanna look at, well, anyway, so, so I'll get to, we, we will, this is part of the presentation of the full course winning with Jyotish and which planets have what effects. So Saturn on the 10th cusp would have actually been very good Believe it or not, Saturn is a positive influence when he sits on the 10th cusp of a team. So he would have benefited the ascendant, the, the team signified by the ascendant, so the favorite. If Saturn sat on the opposite here in the fourth house, the fourth cusp, he would have benefited the underdog because the fourth house of the underdog is actually uh, the fourth house of the horoscope is the 10th house of the underdog. Now that doesn't make sense, just watch. If this is the underdog here, counting 10 houses away, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So the fourth house here is the 10th house for this team. And again, if Saturn were conjunct or any planet were conjunct, it would affect this team dramatically, much more dramatically than you would expect by its simple occupation of the house. Okay, I'm going too far ahead now, but I, but I do want you to get an idea of where we're going. So we will be using cusps and specifically the cusps of the sixth, the 10th and the first for both teams. So that means the first, sixth and the 10th, and then the first cusp of this team, which is this house, the seventh, twelfth, and the fourth. All right, so I hope I haven't bef muddled your minds yet too much, but this is the kind of stuff we're going to need to know. And that's why these Upachaya houses are important to know and memorize. So these are the houses. Now we're going to throw out the third house because again, it's not a, uh, uh, that important, but um, these are the Upachaya houses and they're critical for understanding competitions. Um, and, and that's it. That's all I want to cover for the houses today. Now, do you guys have any questions um, about uh, this presentation or about the course in general?
and again, I'm, I'm, my goal here is, is to steer this uh, free introduction to Vedic astrology uh, in the direction of uh, the winning with Jyotish, because that's, that's who, you know, that's the, the primary goal here. Um, for a more thorough uh, introduction, um, uh, read James Kelleher's books, check out Light, um, uh, Light on Life as well, and uh, Decoding Your Life Map with Vedic Astrology, parts one and two. You have a more uh, general introduction, but I'm trying to groom you to get you ready so that once we hit uh, start with our classes, you know exactly what we're talking about. And again, as a preview, we're also going to be relying on the Navamsha, this D9 chart which in my opinion is the most powerful predictor of outcomes when it applies. And in fact, um, yeah, and so that's, that's going to be part of our, our training as well. And we'll talk about the Navamsha next week. All right, so I don't want to keep you uh, any longer than this. Um, this is the presentation for today. Your homework is review the houses and then begin to read about the planets. I've introduced the planets who are the actors. Um, here, here is a question from the chat. What is the name of the program that I'm using? This program is called Parashara's Light, and the, uh, it's one of the uh, sort of top professional programs. There is also Sri Jyoti Star, which is a fine program. Uh, me personally, I use Parashara's Light, and the uh, the author, the, the founder of Prashara's Light, has given me permission to my students to extend a 30% discount to them, um, which is, so the normal program is about 300 bucks, so you get it for about 210 if you would like to order the program. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's something he's offered to all of my uh, Jyotish students. So that's one of the bonuses you get. Um, and if you, you, yeah, but really, you know, you can use any program. That's the truth of it is any program that can give you this chart uh, and ideally show you the cusps. You do need to be able to see the cusps, to see the outer planets um, will work. So I, I don't have uh, anything against any other programs which, which do the job. This one just happens to work for me, okay? All right. Um, any other questions? And you guys can feel free to speak up too. Uh, don't, uh, don't be shy. Was this, uh, uh, I mean, was this helpful to you? Okay, so I see. Um, can you talk about the cusp as in the beginning of a house and how many degrees? Yeah, this is a good question. So how exactly are the cusps um, calculated? And there are in, in, in astrology, so first of all, even before addressing that, um, I should address the question of why we use cusps in Vedic astrology. Uh, cusps are typically, typically, um, a Western astrological concept. We do have cusps, something called Shripati, uh, but these are different. These are not Shripati cusps. So a cusp in Western astrology most typically is the beginning portion of a house. Um, so let me go back to the chart here. So for all intents and purposes, the first house begins at 10 degrees, 53 minutes of Pisces. And then anything uh, behind that is actually not in the first house. And a better representation I can show you is here. So let me pull up. One second. All right.
This is the western wheel of a, of a match. And in the western chart, these cusps are better represented. So here is, this is the cusp of the first house. This here, five degrees, 39. But keep in mind, this is the western horoscope, the western uh, zodiac, which is 24 degrees ahead of the Vedic or, or sidereal zodiac. This is not something we've discussed today, but um, it, tomorrow we, we'll introduce these concepts. My, my goal is not to get you too bogged down in the philosophy of the differences, although they are certainly worth knowing, but to go right into the practical. So the, fir the cusp of the first house is five degrees here. Anything under five degrees is in the 12th house. See, this is the 12th house, 11th house, 10th house. That's how you see it in the Western horoscope. In the Vedic horoscope, it's a little harder to see. And that's why we refer to the table. The good news is we're not, all we care about is, is a planet within two and a half degrees if it's a visible planet, or two degrees if it's an invisible planet like Rahu or Neptune or Pluto, of a cusp. We don't care if it's in the house before it or after it. All we care about is the sensitive point. And in this case, here's the ascendant 1053. And yes, we have Venus within two and a half degrees. So Venus is going to strongly uh, influence this event whatever this event is in Mobile, Alabama. Okay, it actually happens to be our webinar today and Venus is the eighth house. Ruler means we talked about a lot of eighth house stuff. So be that as it may. Um, so th that's, that's as far as I'm gonna go with cusps for now. The system of cusps we use is called the Placidus cusp. Um, and there are various systems out there. Um, but Placidus is, is the one that uh, we will use because that's what Krishnamurti, this famous Vedic astrologer, who sort of really rocked the boat of Vedic astrology by going, going to the Placidus house system, because he found that the min minute changes that you could see in the change of a cusp affected outcomes. His problem was he would see the chart of two twins. Let's say in Mobile, Alabama at 8.55, the first twin was born and five minutes later or 10 minutes later, the second twin was born. Well, folks, their main chart is gonna stay the same. In fact, even the Navamsha may stay the same if, if they come you know, one after the other. So, but he found that many twins lead radically different lives. Some lead very similar lives, but others lead very different lives. And he figured that it had to be because the cusp of the houses were changing somehow. And that's when we get to the sublords, and that's another whole nother level of presentation that we're um, gonna get to in the main course. Um, so the placement of the cusp is very important. And for right now, I just want you to understand that when a planet is very near to a cusp, it will affect that team, the team represented by the cusp very strongly, like the Vulcan death grip. And it can be in a positive way. So if Saturn in the 10th is, is there for a team, it's very good. Jupiter is good and so on. Okay, I hope. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a uh, that answered your question, but all right. Any other questions so far? Okay. Well, so let's leave uh, leave this for now. It's been uh, been about an hour and a half. I'm going to let you guys go, and uh, if you have questions that come up, feel free to email me at my email. And, um, and we will see you in the second installment. Um, 
of this introduction to Vedic astrology, specifically for the purposes of uh, the course winning with Vedic astrology to get you ready for that class. So hopefully you have the houses down and um, and next week we'll um, we'll discuss more. Any final questions before we end the class today? Okay. Well, thank you for joining me, guys. And um, next time we'll start the class without the ruler of the eighth house conjunct the ascendant. How's that? <laughs> Hopefully things will run a little more smoothly. But there you go. Jyotish is always in play. And, uh, and truly, by the way, Jyotish is always in play. Um, if somebody asked me about the Super Bowl earlier, and, uh, and I, I've, I went on record with a, a fellow astrologer of mine that I was not wagering on the Super Bowl, uh, partly because um, the chart showed three previous charts that had the same configuration as the Super Bowl. I, let, I guess let's end with this because it's interesting. We just saw a pretty dramatic Super Bowl. Um, and I'll pull the chart. I didn't get to personally witness the start of the game. In fact, I didn't watch any of the game. Um, and that's another reason why I did not wager or... Um, let me see, where is the Super Bowl chart? Gosh, is this it? Yeah, so this is the chart. Previously, in the week before, there were three or four games played with this exact same chart. And what happened in each of those games is that the underdog, shown here by the seventh house, played incredibly well They for half the game. So they took the lead at halftime. And then what happened in each of the games is that the favorite came back and won. And I mentioned this to a, a fellow astrologer of mine. And I said, I'm just, it's too wild. I'm not, I'm not betting on it. But I do like the strength that the underdog shows. See, they have the malefic in their ascendant. And Atlanta, the underdog, showed a lot of strength, especially early. But exactly as happened previously, um, the favorite came back and miraculously won it. So Jyotish always plays out. And, and unfortunately, you know, some of us don't have the cojones to, you know, make a wager on it, but there it is. And um, it, the, it pretty much the same chart. Now, I don't know if it started exactly at 537 or 535. If someone did catch the exact time, I'd be happy to look at it. But this is the general chart. And the exact same thing happened in soccer games and basketball games the week to 10 days prior that had the same similar looking chart. So I suggest to you one of the ways to find winners is just to watch patterns and to watch what happens. And even though you may not have invested in any of those previous soccer games or basketball games, by seeing a similar chart, you can deduce similar results. So. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of, um, you know, you don't have to be a, a brilliant astrologer to do that. You just look at the patterns. Uh, so there you go. That's Jyotish is always in effect. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, hopefully this was useful to you. Uh, drop me a line if you have any questions. And we will see you uh, for next week's class. All right. Namaskar. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvina Vadhita Mastu Ma Vidvishavahe Om Shanti 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 Hari Om. Bye now.